Usually, before we'll believe something, we want proof, or as much proof as we can get. Before you buy a car, you try to check it out. Before I'll try to skate across that frozen lake, I'm going to make sure the ice is solid. But when it comes to the supernatural, ESP, psychic powers, astrology, and so forth, lots of people have a different standard. They believe because they want to believe. They care less about proof because believing makes them happy. <laughs> now, if you're only four years old, it's okay to believe in things we know not to be true, like Santa Claus. He lives in the sky. Who does? Santa Claus. Tell me about the Easter Bunny. He's real? What does he do? He gets the candy. To learn more about what psychologists call magical thinking, <laughs> Professor Robert Cavanaugh at Williams College in Massachusetts devised a test that involves an imaginary animal and a box. He repeated it for us on these four to six-year-olds. First, he divides the kids into pairs, and then his research assistant calls the kids' attention to the large empty box. You guys have been so good. As we watch from behind a two-way mirror, the children are shown that there's nothing in the box. Then she tells them a story about a hungry fox who lives in the box. And his name is Freddy Fox. They're told it's just pretend. I think I hear him, and I think he's going to come out of his house. And she again tells them it was all make-believe. We're just pretending, and there's no fox in that box, okay? I know that. Then she tells them she has to leave them alone for a few minutes. I'll be right back. Now, I assume that the kids, having looked in the box, will know that there's no fox in there. But they don't. Some hear the fox. They worry about it. Some go to the box to listen, but are afraid to open. I want this. No. So one pair does. Some kids accept that there's no fox in there, but most kids aren't sure. This is what happens in test after test. Almost every child begins to believe that the animal they helped create might be real. Hey guys, thanks for waiting. You are. Even when the researcher explains again that there was no fox in the box, most children believe it was there. I told or I need that the fox will come out. Even Emma, who looked in when Isaac opened the box. Isaac opened the box and he saw the largest fox. <gasps> Sometimes when we form beliefs, those beliefs persist against logic or evidence to the contrary. When I talked to the kids later, many were still convinced that the fox was in there. Are you sure? No. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is a fox. There is a fox. There I know a fox. We saw one. We saw one. Yeah. Now, while magical thinking's fine for kids, it's another thing when adults do it. As you can see, all the children show the same symptoms. Strong hallucinations and lack of reason. Can this be something natural for a human being? It's because we are raised with fairy tales, stories without reason? Form your own conclusions. Religion is an idea accepted as true on earth. Professions like priests and bishops exist solely because of this idea. They are paid by the system even though all they do is confuse the population. In the same system we have a contradictory idea, called science, which seeks to find answers rather than make them up. I say this, because religion is based on the idea that the world was created by divine intelligence, because of some ancient writings, and science has discovered that the world that we know, the universe, was formed in a completely different manner. Religion observes by definition, which is extremely dangerous and science defines by observation, because it appears to be the most logical approach. Religion, not only confuses humans, but is also accepted as a job in the monetary system. Lots of money is given to religious institutions, while at the same time millions of people are starving or have nowhere to stay. Religion might help people with their confrontation with death 
but it's unacceptable for human evolution to allow people to lie to themselves, especially because we are able to explain so many things we couldn't before. For what are you living? Just to please your senses? If you were an eagle, would you lie at the foot of a fruit-bearing tree, just because it is comfortable, because it's cool there, because from time to time fruit falls? With your amazing ability and great big wings, you accept such a situation just because you feel more comfortable or because you're afraid not to fall when you fly? Because I see no evidence whatever any of the Christian dogmas, I've examined all the stock arguments in favor of the existence of God, and none of them seem to me to be logically valid. Do you think there's a practical reason for having um, a religious belief for, for many people? Well, there can't be a practical reason for believing what isn't true. Uh, that's quite, uh, at least I rule it out as impossible. Either the thing is true or it isn't. If it is true, you should believe it, and if it isn't, you shouldn't. And uh, if you can't find out whether it's true or whether it isn't, you should suspend judgment. But you can't, uh, it seems to me, a fundamental uh, dishonesty and a fundamental treachery to intellectual integrity to hold a belief because you think it's useful and not because you think it's true. Well, I was thinking of those people who find that um, some kind of religious code helps them to live their lives. It gives them a very strict set of rules, the rights and the wrongs. Yes, but you Do know, there, those rules are generally quite mistaken. Uh, a great many of them do more harm than good. And uh, it would, they would probably be able to find a rational morality that they could live by if they drop this uh, irrational, traditional, taboo morality that comes down from savage ages. Holy human pray. beings, I'm, we pray for all kinds of I'm things. Told, I'm told by people who pray, I, I say to them, suppose God doesn't answer your prayer, and they say, well then, uh, it's his will, I will accept his will. What is the point of praying in the first place if you're going, if he's going to do what he wants to anyway? There's supposedly a divine for plan. How are you so arrogant as to ask him to change his plan for some narrow reason, whether it's health or, or wealth? I mean, because I we are arrogant. We all think the but, world but, revolves around us. But do us. you think prayer works? I mean, I, I pray do. to Joe I, I, Pesci. I don't believe in... I pray to Joe Pesci and I get the same yeah. results. <laughs> I get the same results I used to get from God when I was nine years old and I, and I believed in the invisible man in the sky. Yeah. You get about half the things you pray for. It's, a, it's, it's a laws of probability. Half the things you pray for you get, half of them you don't. You write off the half you don't, the half you get, so is any great. And it's just a game. It's a, it's a form of mental illness. No, I swear. Yeah. I, I just don't want the lightning to hit me. Look, look, uh, relax, prayer, relax, prayer. Heart. Try to relax. <laughs> Try to relax. Try to relax. You pray for me. So you think God. God would throw a lightning bolt at you also? I think. Don't you Listening think to what I just heard, as no insulting as that is, there is no God. Of Will he strike me dead right now? Will he? <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> dare. You know what? He not. doesn't <laughs> dare. He doesn't <laughs> dare. He doesn't <laughs> dare. I <laughs> care about our individual. I have, a, I have a good point. Yes. But, you know, when you when you talk about God in this society, when you profess a belief in God, they just toss the name around. You know, every end of every politician's <laughs> speech. God yeah. bless. God bless us all. God bless you. God bless America. <laughs> And, and let me say and God this. bless you and God, God bless, bless your book being number one. That's that's lovely. He, he had very little to do with that. It's all individual Ooh. human. Oh, please let me explain something. Uh, God, it's it's a wonderful idea. It's a nice fantasy. It's a way of keeping people in line. It's a way of controlling people. There is as much proof Everything for the existence of God, or even evidence. Forget proof. There's as much evidence for the existence of God as there is for the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrials, and yet, if you mention them for a moment, you're considered outside, beyond the pale, you're a kook, you're marginalized, you're crazy. If you mention, if you don't, if you don't love God, then you're, you're some, there's something wrong George, with you. It's absurd. It, there's it no, makes, what if it makes people feel better? That's a different thing. That is. If you want to exactly. give the universe the name God, that's fine. The universe exists. We are all equal parts of it. We are don't, made of the same stuff. Aren't most, aren't most, aren't most, religions, most religions are based on the idea that somebody in some way through prayer can yes, make you but feel why better. do you need to make up stories? Yes. Why, should why be a does person? the supreme being have to be just 
life is hard, and you need to make up stories. You need to make up stories. As long as you realize that. You're weak minded. You need that. You need that help. The arrogance of the people. I know a lot of strong minded people who are very, very sincere. They appear strong minded, but if they really believe that there's a man in the sky keeping score, something is wrong with that. As long as you believe in something that makes you happy. I believe. I believe in the vastness of the universe and in infinity. I believe in family and friends. I believe in love. So that's and your those, God. Those, no, it's and not my God. Those are, those are not God. That's your spiritual God means an old man in the sky. It doesn't mean that to me. Well, I don't Why do you use the word? Why do you need the word God? What does the word God do? Yeah, I don't need the word God. Does he decide actually. things for no, you? No, he doesn't. I don't believe in then a you don't at believe all. what all these I other people in believe. The universe, you have, I, a, you have, have a more sophisticated approach. When we go to church on Sunday, and say, Dear God, do this, do that, or God bless America. So here we are telling God who to bless, which is an insult to all religions. If you feel God made everything in the universe, He's ultra smart. You don't have to tell Him your aunt Penny is sick. He's a pain, please. He's oh gee, thanks for telling me. <laughs> you see, we made God as dumb as we are. So all religions are crap today. They don't even understand what they mean. I remember a minister telling me that God knew everything, made every planet, every bug, every leaf, everything, knew everything. And then Jesus proceeds to insult God. Let me tell you where he did it. Just before they crucified him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not what they do. And God said, gee, I didn't know that. So, so you see, Jesus was a nice guy, but not very bright. There are people that nail a piece of wood together and, that, and they kiss it before that. They don't kiss it. Till you nail it up so it looks like a cross, then you kiss it. <laughs> so, what was the day before it was a cross? Two pieces of wood or some copper that wasn't cast in the form of a cross. And the cross is a crucifix, which was long before people wore it. It was to crucify people. So it's just symbolic, depending on what culture you come from. I, that's why I can't accept anything except the sciences. The shape of an airplane wing is designed for a certain lift. The shape of the plane is designed for certain conditions. Many people have tried to explain the origins of religion and the mystery according to which this story is believed to be true even today. Some even proclaim to be atheists, but their approach is misguided, because they are creating conflict by opposing religion. If we dismantle all existing ideas on the planet Earth, we will choke to death. Religion is an idea, and those who support it must come to show the proof that it is true. Otherwise it's not of any use. It's much easier to observe and define, than to take each definition and analyze it. Religion is a selfish idea, designed to comfort those uncomfortable with ignorance. So, if you want to believe, fine. But do not present your idea as evidence when it's impossible to verify, especially to children. Hello my child. Welcome to this world. Before you grow up, there are a few things I need to tell you. You were born worthless. Void corrupt. You were born a sinner, and the wages of sin is death. Someday, when you are old enough to understand, you must ask forgiveness. Not for anything you've done, but for what others did thousands of years ago at the beginning of the world. Also, you must tell God how sorry you are for murdering his son Jesus. I know, it happened generations before you drew your first breath. 
And it was ultimately part of God's divine plan, but the responsibility is yours. You are guilty, and you must ask to be forgiven. A portion of everything you produce in your lifetime must be given to God, who will never accept your offerings personally. You will listen for him, but his voice will never be heard audibly. You will thank him for his direction and guidance, but his mysterious ways will confuse you. In fact, although you are more important to God than anything else in the universe, he will never show you his face or reveal himself in any provable way. I know this seems strange. To truly know God, you must study a book, an ancient book, written thousands of years ago in a language you do not understand. You must fulfill a great commission to make others see the world as you do, to have them believe as you do, to live as you do, and then to go out and convince even more to do the same. As a reward for this, you will be given the privilege of praising God without end for all eternity in a hidden happy place that can only be seen by the dead. You must pledge your entire life on this earth to your invisible father and his great commission, or he will send you to a dark pit where the flesh is roasted from your bones and you writhe in unimaginable agony forever and ever and ever. But you must not do this because you fear horrible torture and pain. You must do it because you love God. No matter what happens throughout your lifetime, the more your world seems to defy everything I've taught you here, just continue to say the words out loud. God is real. God is good. And one day, you will look into the eyes of your own child and you'll teach him these very same things so that he can someday teach his own children and their children and their children for generations. You'll hold him in your arms and you'll look down at him and say, Welcome to this world. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I need you to get serious, serious with God. Say, God, I'm here to be trained. I'm here for an education. I'm willing, God. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. In Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit can't talk. All right, now I want everyone to raise your hands and we're going to pray in tongues. Hallelujah, let's do it. Oh, we love you, Jesus. So, say something about Harry Potter warlocks are enemies of God and I don't care what kind of hero they are they're an enemy of God and had it been in the Old Testament Harry Potter would have been put to death Amen. you don't make heroes out of warlocks this is a generation that's going to stand for purity and righteousness and holiness and you're going to serve the Lord all the days of your life. And we declare all those things over you. 
I believe this so much that I have given my whole life to see to it that you get there. I sense in my heart tonight what I heard the Lord say is that there's some kids here that say they're Christians that go to church all the time, but you're one thing when you're at church and you're another thing when you're at school with your friends. You're a phony and a hypocrite. You do things you shouldn't do. You talk dirty just like all the other kids talk dirty. And it's time to clean up your act. Come up here and get washed. Because we can't have phonies in the army of God. If that's you, put your hands up here. Whoa, baby. Wash your hands. Father, we just wash them with the water of your word. We say no more, devil, no more. Say it, boys and girls, in the name of Jesus. You know exactly what you need to repent of. Name it. Name it out loud. Name it. What do you need to be forgiven of? No more hypocrisy. Now you go somewhere and pray and you start doing some repenting here. Speaking of that, watch this video in which a priest from Moldova drowns a child during a ritual called baptism. Many say it was an accident, but the ritual was not an accident, because if religion did not exist, those people wouldn't put the child into such a risky situation. Observe how the child is sunk according to priest's words, not taking into account the child's integrity, but the ritual and the spoken words. It's the most shocking video that shows how a completely innocent human being an animal without any control of the situation is killed by the selfishness of others who, either because that's how they were raised or from their fear of death, they accepted religion, which promotes such events. The religion idea saved many lost minds, but who created those states in the first place? Religion offers a peaceful death, it's true, but it's like taking Xanax for all your life, in order not to be worried about death. Would you? If yes, then give up religion and do it. And the cool part is, that you can start the treatment when you get old. I'm not making fun of this. But if you're accepting religion only for this reason, death, then this is a real solution. How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated so that the energy content 
contained within it, gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it, just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. Another person comes over and says, I'm a spiritual person. I'm sure you've heard that shit. And I say, you're a spiritual person. You don't have any locks on your door. And if there's poor people, you invite them in your home and feed them. Oh, no. Well, what the hell do you mean when somebody says that? Always ask them, what do you mean by spiritual? What do you mean by... A person comes to me and says, I'm a member of a club of higher consciousness. I said, what does that mean? Higher consciousness. So I said, where's your kidney? Hmm, not sure. How fast is the blood moving to your vein and artery? I don't know. What do you mean by higher consciousness? A lot of people are as full of shit as a Christmas turkey. Because they really don't know what they're talking about. We have reproduced every aspect of the God experience, every essence, every component of it, from the rising sensation to the feelings of ecstasy to the feelings of a sensed presence to the feelings that you're at one with the universe. We can do that experimentally. Professor Persinger has gone straight to the source of creativity, emotion, and fantasy by stimulating this area, the temporal lobes and the limbic system, with complex magnetic fields that set up electrical charges in the brain. In our presence, one subject had a near-death experience. A sudden wave of darkness. It's a distant point of light. No two people have responded in exactly the same way. Just but all of them come out of this chamber with a profound sense that something hugely significant has taken place. It's a sound chamber that doesn't allow anything from the outside to come inside and I start hearing voices I start seeing things started with faces there was a lot of faces but distorted faces m moving kind of almost like seeing something through heat I felt a presence behind me like kind of staring down at me and it seemed very strange this presence was it wasn't it wasn't frightening at all it was very comforting actually it was like dreaming, but I was awake. Just like when you have a dream, sometimes you wake up and your dreams are just so, it was so real. I saw bright lights and I heard voices. Was that God speaking? What, or was that Professor Persinger just flipping a few switches? What we have found is that individuals who show a temporal lobe sensitivity or creativity and who are very religious, in that setting, they will have a religious experience. We can generate the sensed presence which is defined as God. Everybody fighting over this religion shit. You understand me? The Christians say Jesus is the message. The Muslims say it's Muhammad. I say, who gives a fuck who the message is? Did you get the message? <laughs> they got the same damn message. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Science proves that to be a fact. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Don't fuck with me, and I won't fuck with you. Among other ideas are Divinity 2012 and the end of the world, or other conspiracy theories, I'm not making fun of them, I'm not saying that those are not true, but are just like religion, ideas, and until they are proven to be true, we'll keep that status. Let's see how some of these ideas are viewed from a scientific standpoint. Okay. The Planets Today is a marvelous work of fiction. Oh yes, yes, there is no such thing as Planet Nimburu or whatever they say. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fiction. And, it, and they cite sources that cite NASA sources. They don't cite NASA. Just check the websites, you'll see. And it's all related to the doomsday predictions of the year 2012. 
Yes, that's what you're getting at. That's behind your question, isn't it? Yes. 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 You want to know if the world is going to end on December 21st, 2012. <laughs> because the same website that tells you about Planet X, this secret planet that will has a, a strongly elliptical orbit that will come into our zone in 2012 and knock Earth off its axis, combined with on December 21st, 2012, that the center of the galaxy, the sun and the Earth will come into perfect alignment and the excess gravity will then also tip Earth off its axis and it'll be end of the world as we know it. This is what these web pages will tell you. Um, turns out, if you go to December 21st and look at the star charts, it's true. The center of the galaxy, the sun and the Earth will come into perfect alignment. It will, it's true. What the site does not tell you is that that happens every year on December 21st. They left that out of the account. So it's a fun work of fiction. Uh, Earth will be here before, during, and after 2012. I will add that the movie 2012 that's being marketed right now, that's going to come out in 2012, and they want you to do all the homework for the movie, so they say, just Google it. And if you Google 2012, it's filled with thousands of web pages on Doomsday written by people who didn't take enough science in school. Um, they, uh, so you Google it. I saw some of the previews for it, and I was worried that I, we would, you know, all of us in this business would just be inundated with having to sort of correct misconceptions. Then I saw what, what they actually show in the movie. And the movie's like, aliens come and they take over the capital. And I said, oh, that's just another sort of, like the movie Independence Day. No, that, that's fine. It's just Hollywood. Remember, it's much easier and safer to observe and define instead of believing such ideas and trying to find arguments that support them. In fact, it's a total loss of time to analyze all these ideas. Those who support them must come with evidence. In addition to this, it is impossible to prove such a negative. How can we prove that Santa Claus does not exist? We follow all the houses on Christmas Eve and, if we do not notice Santa Claus, then, does it mean that he doesn't exist? No, it means that he didn't appear that Christmas. We go even to the North Pole to look, and we don't find him. But, we still have not demonstrated that he doesn't exist. We just proved that in that night of Christmas, and in that time on North Pole, he is not present. That's all. You cannot prove that Santa Claus does not exist, but, only, maybe, that he is unlikely to exist. The same thing happens with religion, God, conspiracy theories and so on. Remember, it is impossible to prove such a negative. Do not forget, the universe exists, what is happening is happening. Human beings are just trying to observe and define, that's all. It makes no sense to invent convenient stories. All these ideas are accepted or promoted by the monetary system, so, we can't blame it for the poor educational program and promotion of false values. Many people have entrusted their decision making to government. Bingo. And uh, many people have also given that decision making to the deity. They create a deity, then they say, he will make the most appropriate decision. Prevent my house from burning down, prevent my children from being killed and help us uh, along the way. But it's going to take time for people to take on the responsibility of managing this wonderful gift of nature, the earth, water, all the wonderful things we have, topsoil, and we have to take care of the earth. We have to assume responsibility. We have brains, and the brains can be programmed in many different directions. They can go into the abstract region, which has nothing to do with improving our lives. We can invent reasons for nature, or we can say, I don't know how nature works, and hold that in abeyance and try to find out. 
That's the difference between science and religion. Religion has answers. Many of me, the Lord works in strange ways when they can't account for anything. You know, the scientist says, I don't know. Says, what are you going to do about it? He goes into a lab to try to find out what's the best shape for a boat. What's the best arrangement for sails to get the most effective movement from the wind? He says, I don't know. So he sets up an experiment. An experiment is truth-seeking, but tangibly truth-seeking. But philosophy and theology, you sit back on an armchair. You say, well, I guess the trees are here to give us oxygen. The scientists, the trees are here, they produce oxygen, and that enables us to survive. They're not here for that purpose, because there are many remote islands that have trees without any humans producing oxygen. You know, and there are many tidal waves that go over islands without people on them. So they're not there to punish people. Humans are amazingly anthropomorphic. Terribly so. Oh yeah, it's all about us. Yeah. yeah it's all My about mother us. used to be that. She used to say, the ant is going home to feed its young. I said, how do you know that? Maybe going home to eat its young. You know, like the spiders, they, they mate, then the female eats the male. And I'm not talking about pornography, I'm talking about digesting them. Education about the issue of death, the reality which tells us that we are the same with the universe. Scientific reality could make you feel different about this process called death. There's the telescope itself, this conduit to the cosmos. It's a physical, it's a, it's a tube, it's a conduit. And I sit there and I reflect on it. My specialty was the center of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, 30,000 light years away. And so I have my digital detectors, I've got the telescope, it's dark, it's just me on this mountain and the universe. And I look up and I just think to myself, there are photons that have been traveling for 30,000 years. And I'm sort of snatching them from this journey and planting them into my digital detector. And then I started feeling bad for the photon and I said, maybe it wanted to continue. But I got in its way. But then I said, no, those are probably happier photons than the one that slammed into the mountainside that will go unanalyzed and will not, will not contribute to the depth of our understanding of the universe. But so, so there's not only the fact that I'm on the mountaintop, there's the knowledge and the feeling that I'm reaching out to the universe with these methods and tools of science. We can trace the elements. They were forged in the centers of stars, high mass stars, that went unstable at the ends of their lives. They exploded, scattered their enriched contents across the galaxy, sprinkled into gas clouds that then collapsed and formed stars and planets and life. And so these ideas, these cosmic perspectives, this pilgrimage to the cosmos, there are people who say, this makes me feel small because I need to see the immensity of the cosmos. And I say, no, you're, you're not thinking about it the right way. You're not, by the way, when we opened our facility, I got a letter from a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania. He had seen our show, which was a zoom out from Earth, and Earth just shrinks to nothingness as you go to the edge of the universe. And he wrote me a letter that says, I'm a, I specialize in the psychological effects of, oh, how did he word it? Excuse me, he said, uh, 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 Hello, Dr. Tyson. I'm, you know, Johnny Jones. I'm, I'm a, a psychologist specializing in the effects of things that make people feel insignificant. I thought, bummer of a job. Man, is that what you do for a living? <laughs> and he said, and he said, needless to say, your show was the greatest eliciter of feelings of smallness I have ever seen. Will you allow me to conduct a survey on the people who visit your show? And I thought to myself, there's something wrong here, because why does he feel small? But when I look up in the universe, I feel large. Then I realized the problem was his ego was too large to begin with. He came to the problem thinking too highly of who and what he was to begin with. Because then everything that happened in the show destabilized his self-image. 
Whereas I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking, but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. But what I want to know is, I want you got you, we're in one of the greatest centers of neuro, neurophysiology. I want somebody to put electrodes on my head. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos, when I do the calculation that shows that a 15 ton meteorite that we have in the center of the Rose Center for Earth and Space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. Tell me what part of my brain is lighting up because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? That it's not simply, as, as Carl Sagan said, we, you know, we are star stuff, but there's a more poetic and I think more accurate way to say it. It's quite literally true that we are stardust. In the highest exalted way, one can use that phrase. And so I feel and I use words. I bask in the majesty of the cosmos. I use words, compose sentences that sound like the sentences I hear out of people who had revelations of Jesus, who, 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 who go to, um, who, who go on their, their, their pilgrimages to, uh, to Mecca. There's some commonality of feeling. I know it. Well, I don't know it. I want someone to do that experiment because the day you do, if the same centers in my brain are excited by these cosmic thoughts as a what are going on in the mind of a religious person, that's something to know. That's going to be really interesting finding. Because what that tells me as an educator is, let me offer the universe to people. And they'll start taking it in. And they'll start achieving those feelings that they had before. And I don't so much care whether they abandon previous feelings. I've got an offering that keeps growing, that keeps becoming more majestic. When the Hubble telescope was announced that we were going to cancel, oops, when it was announced that we were going to cancel the Hubble telescope, the greatest outcry to not do that was not the astrophysicists. It wasn't from within NASA. It was the public. It was all over the op-ed pages and the talk shows. The public took ownership of the Hubble Space Telescope because the universe was coming into their bedroom into the living room, onto their computer. They were a participant on the frontier of, the dis of discovery. And as far as I can tell, if you let them, let them know that it's not something that we're in the universe, but in fact, given the chemistry of it all and the nuclear physics of it all, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. And I don't know any deeper spiritual feeling and what that brings upon me. I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts. You see, we have made life into a hideous thing, living. Life has become a battle, which is an obvious fact. Constant fight, fight, fight. And we have divorced that living from death. We separate death as something uh, horrible, something to be frightened about. And we say, and to us this living, which is misery, is we accept. If we didn't accept this, existence as misery, then life and death have, are the same movement. If the general picture, however, of a Big Bang followed by an expanding universe is correct, what happened before that? Was the universe devoid of all matter and then the matter suddenly, somehow, created? How did that happen? 
in many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or, if we say that God always existed, why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here? These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. The bizarre behavior of human beings that invent and then try to prove it's normal when they do not have the knowledge and technology to discover. So, human beings must be properly educated. <laughs>